first of all, I want to say, if you're new to MOCA, how many of you have not been here before? Several of you. Okay, this is less than half of the space they had, say, a year or so ago. And they are in the process of planning and building a new, brand new freestanding building for MOCA. It was founded around uh, the same year as 9-11. So it overcame that. I think it will overcome the coronavirus, but it has really slowed down everything uh, for them. And they have been a real gift to the artist of this area, and for me also as one of those artists. So if you wanted to make a donation to the arts, it's a great organization. They have done a lot. And, uh, and we'll continue to do so. Okay. Yes. I wanted to start with this installation piece. And I was thinking about the nature of, of artwork anyway. And all of it is experimental. As soon as you put ink or paint or whatever on paper, you really can't predict what's going to happen. It may take you one direction or another. It may do just what you hoped, but it may not. So, but some of the work in here for me is even more experimental than usual. And this, this being the major experiment, these are roof, roof shingles or tiles from the 1850s. I was coming down from the Nashville area and we left the highway and went to a little town called Bell Buckle, which has a uh, antique store and a restaurant. And so we, on the sidewalk, there were bundles of these things, 25 to a bundle, tied with twine. And I asked the, the owner, what are those? And he said, well, those are roofing materials from the 1850s. And um, I said, well, how much do they cost? I might be able to figure out something to do with them. And he told me, and I said, OK, I can afford maybe one stack of these. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so what you see here, the green, this forest green, was already there. It was just made for me. And the kind of ground line that some of them seem to have, that's sort of brown and, and rusty, that was already, all of that color was already there. And I kept them on the floor of my studio for a long time, for more than a year. And I went through a lot of terrible ideas for them. And then, meantime, I was working and, and thinking and reading. And I realized I really don't want to be too, I don't want to be preachy with these things. I want to expose people to some quotations, uh, some poets, some writers that have, have sort of addressed this subject. So that was uh, really my goal with this. And I also didn't want to do anything that would further beat up the tiles. Their kind of weird condition is how they were when I bought them. They all have little holes on their left hand, what I use is the left hand edge. And so that gave me a way to attach them to the wall. And I think of it sort of like, um, uh, you know, the, the inner binding of a book that, you, that would normally be held together. And uh, so I would, what I would, the, um, and Maxine helped me with one of these because in four years, <laughs> the, uh, the greenery had died. And this is dead too, but it's fresher dead greenery than was remaining on there. So uh, it's a little different than the original in the photographs. But uh, what I did was where there was an existing hole, I knew I could attach something. And so I would wrap wire around the little branch or root or whatever I was using. And when I uh, did that, I would put both ends through the same hole. Well, we all know that isn't going to hold. So I had some old buttons, and I could put each end through a different hole of the button and tighten that down and make them very secure. And, uh, but then also, if I need to remove them again to replace them, I can do that easily. Um, and the one in the upper right is a tiny oak tree. Uh, and you can see it still has its little acorn attached at the, at the top. I inverted it. 
and uh, but all of the rest uh, I just think the tiles themselves are absolutely beautiful I realized if I just went in and started with ink or paint on them I probably was going to ruin some and there were 25 to a bundle that gave me one to experiment with and I wanted the others to count so <laughs> so I decided the safest thing was to collage uh, the, just glue the things on with polymer medium which is what I use when I paint. Uh, so I do want to share, there is a wall text over there, but I wanted to share the quotations with you. Um, and the thing I didn't say when I started, if you have questions as I go, go ahead and ask them rather than waiting to the very end of the whole thing. Okay, so here's first quote. I stood by the river today, considering the forms of the elms reflected in the water. Their singular beauty was such that I was forced to turn aside and contemplate them. That is Henry David Thoreau. Then, it is time for us to kiss the earth again. It is time to let the leaves rain from the skies. Let the rich life run to the roots again. Robinson Jeffers. Uh, next, there was, I read a book by Jill Jonas uh, who wrote a book on urban forest. I heard a lecture also at the Carter Center. And she did an amazing job of documenting the history of trees in urban areas in the United States. And it's really quite a, it's not a terribly thick volume, but it is an incredible job of research and writing. Uh, and so some of the tree heroes I listed come from her book, but first was Alexander von Humboldt, 1769 to 1859 are his dates. And he was the first person early, I mean at the very start of the 1800s in South America, in Venezuela, he visited Valencia Lake. There, was, uh, there were people that had lived there for years and years and years, very successfully. And then they decided they wanted to take up agriculture. So they cut down some of the trees which of course reduced somewhat the amount of rainfall. And then they diverted some of the water from the stream that fed the lake, and that further reduced the lake, which then could no longer produce, they had that wonderful high quality protein from the fish that had been in the lake. So of course those died. And finally, the whole population of that area just had to move away. They, the, they had ruined <laughs> what had been a wonderful place for them to live. And he documented that, as I said, very, very early on. And then going through, he lived to be 90, which was also amazing for that time period. People didn't live as long as often they do today. But he, was, he went through Russia and he noticed industrial centers with what I think he called them mist and vapors and you know, he didn't use smog and carbon pollution the way we were. But that was what he was observing. And he documented that by 1850, uh, which is, you know, how many centuries are we going to keep ignoring this stuff? So anyway, that's the end of that lecture. <laughs> so the other heroes, that, which I drew largely from her book, are James Russell Lowell, Eliza Rahama, Skidmore, John Rosenau, Jill Jonas, the author herself in my view, John Muir, William Saunders, David Fairchild, Andy Lipkiss, I'll come back to him, J. Sterling Morton, Theodore Roosevelt, Frank Mayer, Deborah Gangloff. And these you'll have to just look up and find out. But Andy Lipkiss is still alive and working today. I think he's about six years younger than I am, probably. He, when he was 15, he lived in LA. He went to a camp, and the trees there were very beautiful. He was very taken with them. And he talked to one of the counselors, and the counselor said, we're going to lose a lot of these trees. But, and he said, why? What's, and he said, you, looking from this mountain, you see that smudge over there? That is Los Angeles. That is air pollution. It is going to kill off some of these trees. And trees, in fact, help us tolerate the air pollution. But, you know, if it can, they can also be overwhelmed. 
But he then went he back home to LA and rounded up a group of former campers. They went there. They had learned there was a parking lot that was not in use and it was just asphalt coming apart. They removed that, cleared the area, prepared it, and planted trees so that there would at least be the hope of some new trees coming along, which the counselor had told him would be a good idea. Then when he was older, he learned that the California Forestry Service was going to plow under 12,000 little seedlings, saplings, that they had grown. And he said, I want them. If you're going to plow them under, I'll plant them somewhere where, where they're needed. And the Forestry Service said, no, 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 no. We're not going to give them away. And we want $500 for them. And Andy, you know, he was starting college. He didn't have that. <laughs> so he went to a politician. He was a smart guy. And he said, what can I do about this? And the politician said, call a press conference. You need to let the press know. You got to keep in mind this is California in the early 70s, which was a magical place. And so the press loved the story. They picked it up, they published it, and he got his tree people together. He got $10,000 in donations, mostly from children. Most of the donations were 50 cents. And so it was really a children's campaign. And he uh, then received from a dairy uh, 12,000 milk cartons, paper milk cartons. This was what they used before everything went to plastic. And they said, you can have these to put each of the saplings into so you can transport them. And he bought one load of fill dirt. The company gave him a second load for free. And then American Motors, and here's the real miracle, said, we have a fleet of Jeeps. We'll let you use our Jeeps to take these saplings where you need them to be and uh, plant, get them planted. And so that was astounding, and they got it done. It succeeded. They went back. They looked after the trees. And these were all in more impoverished areas, areas that really had a lot less foliage and it was a great improvement for their community. Okay, back to the quotations. Imagination is a tree. This is Gaston Bachelard, the French philosopher. And this is a beautiful Thoreau. It is remarkable how universal these grand murmurs are, these backgrounds of sound, the surf, the wind in the forest, waterfalls, etc which are yet to the ear and are and in their origin are essentially one voice, the earth voice, the breathing of the creature. The earth is our ship, and this is the sound of the wind in her rigging as we sail. Um, as I said, that's Henry David Thoreau. This is another wonderful one from W.S. Graham. Imagine a forest a real forest, you are walking in it, and its size, round where you go in a deep ballad on the border of a time you have seen to walk in before. That's one part of a very long poem, and it's really a, a wonderful poem. Uh, imagine being a tree, trembling beside a stream, casting your shadow on winter stone, that's Catherine Mitchell, some nobody. <laughs> and a forest is, in all mythologies, a sacred place. And so that's, again, Henry David Thoreau and his dates were 1817 to 1862. Okay, next, while it looks like you can, some of you can see it from where you are, uh, this is the Earth's eye right here. And uh, this also has a debt to Thoreau. He lived uh, on Walden Pond, as we all know, and it was also very near a pond called White Pond. He felt that, but believed that both of those were like the Earth's eye. They were so pure and so clear and beautiful. And so I was thinking about uh, what he had written about them. And so you've got two... Two, two ponds and where they sort of come into common space 
it's an I. And of course, Thoreau was not considered a handsome man, but he did apparently have blazing blue eyes that were very penetrating, so they're blue eyes for him. <laughs> Actually, I, I think of the mistakes. I took a little time <laughs> working that out. And on yeah. the back, uh, it says A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. and then A, 1 to 6, B, 1 to 6, and mm -hmm. so on. Okay. So they're, they're, pretty much, they're pretty much fixed. Yes. 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 Uh, how much does each shingle weigh approximately? Uh, you know, I haven't weighed them. As 10 goes, I think they're a little heavy than most tin that's used on a tin roof, which comes in a roll. I don't think you could get these to roll up very well. The next, um, the next two. It kind of varies, and I forget which, what writing is on what piece, but it could be quotations like, like appear here, or it could be my own writing from journals. So it, it varies, uh, according, but it's never meaningless. It's never or it's not to me. <laughs> it's, never, it's never just scribbling, you know, it's always actual writing. But I kind of want it embedded. I feel like that puts a layer of meaning into it, at least for me. Uh, but I don't want people to get so hung up on reading that they kind of miss the work of art. So, um, what I, I, I was in the Boston area and it had snowed. And it was almost dusk, and there was a little stand of trees. And the snow was just barely still coming down, and just enough breeze that some of the snowflakes were blowing off the branches. And I took a very ordinary photograph of it. And then I, uh, my husband has a bigger printer than I do, so I had him print it. And then I took it to Kinko's FedEx, and I said, I want you to blow this thing up really big. And he said, well, you know, it's going to, and I said, I know, I know. It's going to look very weird. Colors that I don't think are there are going to suddenly show up. And it's going to be very abstract feeling. And that's just fine. And he said, well, as long as you know what you're getting into. So he blew them up. And I had, uh, I do like arches or arch whichever pronunciation you prefer, paper. And most of these are on very heavy paper. This was on a roll, but it was just a, a joy to work with it, too. So I gridded off the image from Kinko's, and I gridded off my paper. And I knew something about the working process, that if I started in one corner and worked down, there would be some shift from tighter to looser or vice versa. So I scattered, I went through kind of just picking, I'll get this square, I'll get that square, and so that there wouldn't be a sense of that kind of transition overall. And first, I, after the grid, I noticed there were all these fine branches that I hadn't really seen almost in the earlier photograph. And so I drew those and then I painted the snow itself gray, so there are these little white, like a mosaic almost, running through it. And then I put in the circles and radii, which I hoped would give the kind of floating feeling that the snow had had that day. And the problem was then, after two months of work, it was still born, and I was really, upset about that. It was dead. It just wasn't, wasn't doing anything for me, which is kind of a bad way to feel after two months of very hard work. So I, several, one night, nights later, I woke up about 2.30 and I said, it needs a labyrinth. <laughs> and so the kind of blue that comes in and goes around making concentric squares and then exits. So that's why it's through snowy woods, not just snowy woods. It gave me a way
to move through there, and I think that makes the pieces, the piece, both pieces, work much better than they would have otherwise. So I'd never worked from a photograph before, and I was, I'm glad I did, but that was kind of, kind of it. <laughs> These are two of the earliest pieces in the show, thank you. And this one is Struggle, and this one is Hope. This is when I first discovered that my white oak was diseased, and it was the middle of summer, and I looked down, and on the walkway, there were these crumbled, blackened, I mean, espresso dark leaves that you don't expect to see any time, but especially not in summer, and they had just lots of little dots, um, holes, which you can see in the drawing here, and also in the spread leaf, the kind of emblematic white oak leaf, which I use as a symbol a lot of the white oak. Um, and I called, I started writing about it and, and drawings and everything, you know, put my own, own efforts into its survival. But I called Arborgard and they said, well, the tree's roots have been damaged. Uh, first by the fact that uh, they, it was, had been part of a f small forest that cut down all but two trees. The other tree died long before this one became ill. But um, then they, you know, bulldozed and changed the water flow. There were no trees, the, the, what I call a mycelial web, which is no longer the correct term. It's mycorrhizal web now, and somebody, the science people can correct my pronunciation <laughs> here. But anyway, um, that's, all of that was taken from it. And so, and then we have a trout and the poor tree just is suffering terribly. And when you looked up, you could see the leaves looked good and green, but they were filled with little golden, looked like amber beads inside, in, in the surface of each leaf, embedded. And those were the eggs of a certain type of wasp. And they didn't treat it with any pesticide. They just, they said, white oaks get this. They almost always live. But if you go around town, and I do, looking at white oaks, you'll see that often in the summer, they have a limb that's infected. And it doesn't do any harm because it's not the whole tree. The problem was my whole tree had it. And in one summer, it defoliated and put out three new sets of leaves, which I thought, there is no way the tree is going to survive. But it did, and this is several years now, and it's doing very well. And I still have the roots fertilized every, every spring and sometimes also in the fall. But that's what this is. And then here is the emblematic white oak leaf, and it's beginning to spread out its signals, or roots, if you will. And the little amber beads are just floating across. They're not becoming embedded in the leaf. And then these two, also on the same kind of paper, these are an Italian paper that my, we were in Italy and my husband secretly bought a whole packet of, of this little uh, watercolor paper uh, for me as a gift and gave it to me later. But anyway, uh, this is, I picked up a little lichen, thank you. Uh, it was about the size of my thumbnail and at first I thought I was picking up a piece of plastic, some little ornament off of a toy. And it was a tiny lichen, and it was so beautiful. So I don't always paint pictures of things that try to look like them. But anyway, this is the top surface of the lichen, and then this is the underside, which had a lot more color in it. So it's, it's the same lichen, two different views. And then this I call mycelial web, and it's mycorrhizal web, and again, correct my pronunciation, but I th I th that, that I've learned at Emory, <laughs> and the Emory, I think that mycelial isn't incorrect as much as it's very incomplete, and this, the mycelial came from Peter Bolebin and his book, The Secret Lives of Trees, and then the mycorrhizal uh, web, is, is a richer understanding of what that is all about, I think. That's the difference. And, um, and so there's also, I read, uh, The Forest Unseen 
by David George Haskell, who at the time I think was teaching, was in Sewanee teaching, and a scientist, and the University of the South. And he, he set up an area the size of um, the kind of table paintings that Buddhist monks do with sand in the forest on the floor, and it was an old growth forest. And he took a loop so that he could see very well. And every day he would go to this, this place, the same place, and write about what his observations were, which were really, every chapter is very short, and there's always something that's just sort of, wow, I never knew that, how interesting. So it's a book that kind of keeps you going uh, without a plot and, and just really a wonderful little book. But anyway, there's something called springtails, and I think there are bacteria. So since they seemed important, all the little curly things are springtails. <laughs> and I don't know what their scientific name would be. Okay, the next two, I'm gonna take us over this way now. Uh, this is Night Mist, and these are two of the earlier, kind of earlier pieces. And uh, I was thinking of the way when you look at a forest on a misty night, the, the trees seem to, some of the trees come forward, some go back. It's just sort of a, a almost a unified and yet a, a, a moving back and forth in the landscape, in the view. So that's what that was. This is uh, one of the first real tribute pieces to my own white oak. And this is thinking several things. One, the, the tree. And then rather than taking those circles on out, they were, I felt they were very shortened because its roots had been damaged. It couldn't, couldn't be reaching out. And then the circles are um, moons. And I just thinking, how long? How long before we're going to start paying attention to the causes of this kind of problem and trying to do something about it? I had been to Alaska in 2015, and I'd never seen a glacier before. And this was a, a road scholar hiking trip, not a cruise type trip. But one day we took a, a day boat up the Kenai Fjord to the um, Ialic, and I don't pronounce it correctly, I'm sure, um, glacier, which is sadly diminishing. But it was beautiful, and it was just amazing. It was snowing and almost freezing and sleeting, and it was one of the first days in September. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, the, the blue just has stayed with me, so I've got a lot of blue coming into the work following that experience. And, and as the review said, I decided blue is actually an earth color, too. So, <laughs> um, Anyway, and you can see I did a little bit of painting with printing leaves, um, just dipping them in paint and using them to print to give it more texture. And this one. This one is Walden in winter, and I think it's um, pretty clear. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it needs much, much explanation. There are acorn caps. The acorns had fallen out. So you get these branches with little clusters of caps that are almost like flowers on it. And that's the subject of that. When I came back from, Alaska, from it was another year later than that. Anyway, there was a fire in North Georgia. And people that are familiar with the Hambage Center, which is a wonderful artist retreat, 600 plus acres, just a beautiful place. And they had to shut down, send their artist residents who were there as part of their residency program, send them wherever back home and, and remove all of the art objects, the documents, the books, everything of value out of the place. And fortunately, thankfully, it did not burn. And I was worried because I would wake up in the morning and go outside and you could see the smoke and you could smell it all the way well into Atlanta. So it was really a, a serious thing, and I think teams, crews of firefighters had come in from various parts of the country. And on Thanksgiving Day, uh, interestingly enough, it was a misty, rainy, cold kind of day, first we, of those we'd had 
in a long, long time, and uh, the fire began to, to be more easily controlled. It was finally controlled, and the, the firemen had, built, had dug trenches around various houses and that kind of thing in an effort to preserve what was there. But it did survive. The next one right here is movement. And just thinking of the differences between um, that fire, which fortunately was put out, and then the ghost forest on the other side. And we, when we were leaving uh, Yellowstone, and we, we passed an area of forest that had burned, and I wanted so much, to, we couldn't stop. They were sort of keeping the traffic going. But it was strangely beautiful, if horrific. And you could, the ground was just like charcoal, just crumbled charcoal. And the trees were like black satin because all of their bark had burned off. So they were perfectly smooth and, and beautiful, beautiful black. Uh, but anyway, so that's, those are ghost trees there. And these two here, Walden one, and Walden too. I did in 2018, and that was the, the show that had been the first one of this series of three shows was in Boone, North Carolina at Appalachian State University. And these were too late for that. This was after that show had, had, had um, you know, opened. But I put them in a portfolio, and frankly, I forgot all about them. And, and then when I was preparing for this exhibition, I realized I'm going to have more wall space, thanks to Diane Kempler, who asked to have this, this wall built. Uh, so there would be more, more wall space for her, but also for me. And they said, we'll, we'll remove the wall if you want us to. And I said, no, <laughs> it's a challenge. I've got, <laughs> let's leave it here. I can, I'll, I'll manage this. So these, these are Walden 1 and 2 from 2018. Then the year that was so hard on my white oak was um, just the, the, the year it defoliated so many times and put out new sets of leaves. And I call this one White Oak Night because it was just frightening to me. I really um, was not sure what would what would happen if the tree could survive. And this had been originally a vertical piece and like the size of these larger vertical pieces. And I couldn't resolve the center segment of it. So I, another one of those 2 a.m. epiphanies, I just cut the thing out <laughs> and removed it and then decided I could turn the other two pieces on their side. I partly really wanted that different kind of rhythm, that sort of nervous intensity that I think the, the blacks and whites on the outer part have compared to the other works that are more balanced and, and calm in feeling, perhaps. So that's the story of that piece. And okay, so this is also Thoreau again, and there's a quotation from him, but uh, from Walden Pond, ice was sold every winter, uh, and some of it was even shipped internationally. And one of the, and so Thoreau was there witnessing this, and he was amazed because the pond, when liquid, was so clear and so pure, but when frozen, was green. And it was, he said it was like an emerald. It was just sort of amazing. He didn't have an explanation. I think if he could have lived longer, he might have found one. But in any event, a block fell off the ice cutter's cart, and when it did, it just landed in the road, and it stayed there for well over a week. So passers-by would stop and marvel at it. It was like this big green emerald in the middle of the road. And someone said, why didn't you make it look like an emerald? And I said, well, I thought about that. And to me, I think it would have been a little bit too much pop art feeling. And I felt that the square didn't have that kind of pop art sort of association that a, that a painting of a, a real emerald cut emerald would have. 
And, and in fact, it was a block of ice. <laughs> so, so that's okay. These two are also ghost trees, a little different version of ghost trees. And I did the beginning of the trees um, and well, this one really start. all of this one was rubbings. So there's no underlying tree in this one here. Uh, the circles in this case are sort of the, the growth rings of the trees. But I wanted the trees to look really kind of tortured. And I think they, these forms in this one especially have that feeling. And there are rubbings from different trees. I found it oddly hard to get a really good rubbing of my white oak. I don't know why. But so I've got all kinds of different trees contributing to the rubbings here. And then this one, uh, same thing. In this one, I had more of an underlying tree with writing and things underneath. And some of the writing is still showing through. Uh, you can see bits of it where I intentionally let the the uh, rubbings not quite meet. I cut them in pieces and just sort of collage them as needed into the thing. Uh, and I like having that little bit of the writing come through. And then these would be the broken growth rings of the tree. So it's, and oh, the first part of the title of these two is Feld Forest. And Feld means they've been cut. They've been felled by an axe. And I w wanted that reference, and I think it's pretty accurate because I think when they're really cutting a forest, they cut the trees down, remove what's lumber, and the trunks are there, and then another crew comes in to remove the trunks and bulldoze and whatever all they have to do. Are there other so, questions uh, from, about any of this work from any of you? Yes. Can you speak again about your process? Like, which is the first layer? Are you, write, are you gritting it and then writing and then gluing, gluing <laughs> up and then coloring? Or, you know, so, so you okay. And how do you do the concentric circles? Do you use templates? I use a compass. A compass. A compass. So, um, well, I start with a grid, and I like grids. Now that one I don't think has a grid under it, so that's an exception. But if I think I want a grid at all, then I start with it. And then I usually put a wash on and uh, whatever the under underpainting, undercoating will be. Um, some of these you can see, like the paper is kind of a creamy white, but in this one, for example, you can see that it's been washed over with gray. And then I usually would go, I'm trying to remember on this one, I think the tree would be the next order of business. And I would do whatever writing up and down the texture of the tree. Then I would go over this with charcoal and Conti crayon and get that the way I wanted it. And then I thought the blue was too bright uh, for, the, uh, for what I wanted there. And so I went back with the gray wash and painted around all of those circles of the moons. And again, those are a sort of symbol of, of time for me. And then the, so the final thing are the, is then, then come the circles and the radii. They sit on top of the rest of the image, except for the sheen collé. And the sheen collé is literally glued Chinese. It's sort of a politically incorrect sounding term, but, but it refers to any Asian paper that's translucent and glued down. And my, I'd never thought about using Sheen Cole, but I was in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts years ago, and there was, and I, I just had her name and now it's gone, Sylvia Mangold painting, just a real little one. It was a pretty, it was just a little sketch of a tree. It was very pretty. And then she had torn the Asian paper and it was like a little cloud drifting in front of the tree. And I thought, mine won't look like that, but I can surely do something with the idea of, of gluing that paper down. I like what that does. So all of these that have these really precise looking 
different kind of squares. It's not just the painting, it's the, the, the uh, something else on there that's the Shinko A. And then sometimes I'll have to glaze over that a little bit if it's not quite wh as white as I want it. But, but that's, does that help? <laughs> well, I think you deserve a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>